Hey kids, let's talk about Fidel Castro. We're all familiar with Castro, right? Dictator of Cuba for the whole second half of the 20th century, main antagonist of the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know. Anyway, this man loves three things. He loves Cuba, he loves communism, and good God does the man love dairy. Yep, you heard me right. The all-powerful dictator of communist Cuba is obsessed with anything related to milk and its derivatives. I drew up a little chart here, right? I call it the Leche Lovin Ladder. At the bottom you got dairy farmers, then you got Ross O'Donovan, then Mr. Bones, then starving babies, and then all the way up at the top here, you got Fidel Castro. Today, I'm going to share a few true stories that illustrate his preoccupation. Okay, the first one isn't really a story so much as a fact, but according to several sources, Castro was known to be able to eat 18 scoops of ice cream after a meal. That's more than two pints. If that doesn't impress you, then go try it for yourself. Me, I can barely manage a pint and a half on an empty stomach, and Castro's doing it on top of a full meal. But it gets better. Being such an ice cream connoisseur, Castro ordered the construction of an ice cream shop. But this isn't your average everyday parlor, not by a long shot. He built a straight up ice cream complex taking up an entire city block. This was a piece of modern architecture too, in total contrast to the surrounding slums, all for the sake of ice cream. The place is called Coppelia and it's still open today. Of course, Castro's obsession went beyond just personal pleasure. Dairy was so dear to him that it often found its way into diplomatic interactions. Like one time, a French diplomat came to visit, so Castro whips out some Cuban cheese. Specifically though, it was camembert cheese, a variety that France is famous for. French guy was like, hey, not bad, it's almost as good as the French kind. Uh -huh. Try it again, I think you'll find it's even better than the French. Alright, I wouldn't say that. I'm sorry, are you disrespecting my cheese? In my house? On my island? No, I mean it's good, I just said the French kind is better. Maybe if you froggy fucks bathed once in a while, you'd be able to taste the cheese instead of your own B.O. Listen, you've got your cigars, we've got our cheese, live with it. Fine. Fuck him, it's good cheese. I'm paraphrasing just a little bit, but that's basically how it went down. So already, it's obvious that dairy is of great value to Castro. Most exceptional, however, is how this value reflected in his leadership. Naturally, having an entire nation at his disposal, Castro wanted to bolster the Cuban dairy industry as much as possible. But there was one problem. Cuba initially had two types of cows called La Reinas and Zebus. La Reinas came from the days when Spain ruled Cuba, and Zebus originated from India. Both of these cows are well suited to the Cuban environment, having a very high tolerance for heat. However, they don't produce much milk, they're mostly just raised for their meat. So Castro decides to import thousands of Holsteins from Canada. Holsteins are the classic black and white cows, and as we all know, you can juice these guys for days. They are utterly superior. Only problem is, they're used to living in Canada, so when they're plopped down, under the scorching Caribbean sun, it's going to stress them out. They're not going to be laughing cows by any means. So as a result, Castro's imports still didn't put out enough milk to satisfy his desires. At this point, your average run-of-the-mill dairy queen would have given up. But Castro, he's more than that. He's a dairy dictator. So he ordered the construction of a giant air-conditioned complex with the sole purpose of providing a comfortable environment for his Holsteins. And it helped a little bit, but they were still stressed out. They still weren't putting out at their natural levels. And as you can imagine, imagine climate controlling an entire facility is very expensive, so Castro was forced to abandon the project. But like the astronaut he is, Castro held on to his dream of finding the Milky Way. So he gathered a team of scientists and farmers and ordered them to breed together the Zebus and the Holsteins in order to produce a heat-resistant, lactose-pumping super cow. The breeding efforts were mostly a bust, never producing the bovine master race that Castro longed for. However, there was one exception. Under Castro's program, a single individual was born that met his expectations with flying colors. The cow was named Ubre Blanca, Spanish for white udder, and she produced world record breaking volumes of milk, peaking at 110 liters a day. That's more than 29 entire gallons of lactation. Needless to say, Castro was absolutely euphoric at this isolated success of his. To say he went ballistic would be an understatement. He went intercontinentally ballistic. Like, India hasn't got shit on the levels of cow worship that Castro performed. Daily updates were published in the Cuban national newspaper describing Ubre Blanca's health and productivity. And when she died in 1985, Castro commissioned a giant marble statue of the cow in her honor. He also had scientists harvest tissue and egg samples for the sake of preserving her DNA. After Ubre Blanca's death, Castro's plans for the Cuban dairy industry got even more desperate and ridiculous somehow. This is based off of an actual conversation that he had with his team of scientists in 1987. Okay guys, hear me out. What if... We make cows that are the size of dogs, 
so that way they can live in people's apartments with them. Uh, Fidel, I, I don't think that's going to work. No, 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 it'll work. You just have to grow grass in the apartment, too. You can't be serious. Yeah, you just got to put up some fluorescent lights. Bam, little, uh, little, uh, little grazing patch for your doggy cow. You are a fucking lunatic. And obviously nothing ever came of that idea. And Cuba's dairy industry is still floundering today, sadly. So yeah, if you haven't gotten the picture by now, the dude likes milk. Imagine he's at the birth of his grandson, right? Ah, what a beautiful baby boy. Ah, uh, Fidel, there's something we need to tell you. Your grandson, he's lactose intolerant. Prepare the firing squad. Anyway, there's plenty of other miscellaneous stories surrounding his little preoccupation, like the time the CIA tried to poison his milkshake, so I just decided to highlight a few big ones. Anyway, that's all for today. Till next time, I'm Sam Manella, and thank you for watching. <laughs>
neighborhood by hiding it safely away in their stomachs. Some people drank directly from the street, while the classier among them were seen taking off their nasty sweat-filled boots, filling them up and just gulping away. Keep in mind, while today's version is flavored primarily with cinnamon, this fireball whiskey contained a special blend of spices including ash, street filth, tiny shards of glass and wood, and whatever else you could imagine. But hey, free drinks are free drinks. In the end, 13 people perished as a result of this incident. Was it from the fire? Nope. Smoke inhalation? Mm-mm. Drowning? Still no. Unfortunately, though they did boot, and they did rally, they forgot to do both at once. As a result, all 13 deaths were actually from alcohol poisoning caused by chugging too much runaway liquor. So let this be a lesson, kids. Don't drink street booze. You have no idea where it's been. Just go to a dispensary instead. Moving along, here's another potation inundation, this time on the other aisle. 1814 London was a rapidly growing metropolis, and like all metropolis CSEs, it had its fair share of densely populated slums, one of which was St. Giles Rookery. And what better place is there to build a brewery than amongst the impoverished and thirsty? Unfortunately, said brewery apparently got cocky and decided to skimp out on their iron rings that hold up the big beer things budget, leading to one of the vats completely collapsing and knocking over all the others with it. In total, around 323,000 imperial gallons, or one and a half million liters of beer were unleashed that day. The flood of ale pushed over the wall of the brewery with the same ease that Jared Kushner pushes old ladies down escalators, gushing out into the streets and totally demolishing multiple homes situated nearby. Good morning, America. I'm reporter Pat Lauer. No relation, don't worry. We're here at the scene of the world's biggest party foul. Ma'am, how does this whole thing make you feel? <laughs> Don't worry, this isn't the first time alcohol has torn my household apart. <laughs> In all seriousness, my husband has struck me on multiple occasions. At least eight people are known to have died as a result of the incident, either from drowning or from having their house dropped on them. In spite of this, nobody was held responsible for the disaster, with courts concluding that the collapse was an act of God. I wish people were that lenient with act of God clauses today, like, All right, here's your coffee, ma'am. Whoops. Tss, Jesus Christ, it burns! Yes. That was Jesus Christ who did that. You motherfucker, my legs are fusing together! Hey, God works in mysterious ways. Maybe you were supposed to be a mermaid, who knows? So, I hope the knowledge of these events will serve to empower you in your life going forward. If you find one of your friends trapped in molasses, now you'll say, Don't worry, I'll save you. In a couple days. If your street is ever flooded with hard liquor, you'll say, Oh boy, time to start chugging. In moderation, of course. But why stop there when you can learn a lifetime of practical wisdom with Skillshare.com? Skillshare is an online learning community with over 22,000 classes in technology, design, business, and more. Premium membership gives you unlimited access to high-quality classes on must-know topics so you can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities, and do the work you love. Sure, history can write some pretty insane stories, but hey, so can you. With these courses, you can make the next great American novel or breathe new life into your erotic Sanjay and Craig fanfiction. You ever doodle in the margins of your notebook during class? I know I do. What better way to spice up your notes than with some classy botanical line drawings? No more Celtic knots made out of dicks for me, that's for sure. Join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer just for my viewers where you can get two months of Skillshare for free. To sign up, go to skl.sh slash samo3. Again, listen. Go to skl.sh slash SAMO3 to get two months of unlimited access to over 22,000 classes for free. Act now for this special offer and start learning today. Till next time, I'm Sam Manella and thank you for watching. Hey kids, had a bad day? Well, could be worse. You could be living in a world without modern anesthetic. Today, we'll be talking about some surgical procedures carried out long before the development of medicine as we know it today. Now, once you go back a certain distance, the line between operation and mutilation is pretty thin. So, for our purposes, surgery refers to any bodily manipulation carried out with the intent of fixing some injury or illness. And away we go. 
The very first surgery that we have historical evidence for dates as far back as 6500 BC. It's called trepanning, which is a nice word for carving someone's frickin' skull open using nothing but a rock. Maybe a rock on a stick if you were lucky. In all seriousness though, you can see that a good deal of care went into the procedure, which lets us know that this isn't just the result of random injury. Many skulls even showed signs of healing around the holes, meaning plenty of the people who underwent this whole thing just got up and went about their day afterwards. Alright, hold on, you say. This all sounds bad. Uh, guano insane. No way this was that common of an occurrence. Well, friend, if you've been watching this channel long enough, you should know that if you give human beings the benefit of the doubt, chances are they'll prove you wrong. In fact, so far, over 1,500 Japan skulls have been dug up all across the globe, from Europe to China and even the Americas. This means that between 5 and 10% of all skulls that we've found from the Neolithic period have had at least one man-made hole scraped into them. To put it this way, based on that data, there's a greater probability of someone born in the late Stone Age having their brain brain matter exposed by some shaman with a chunk of flint than someone born in the USA being a redhead. To this day, nobody really knows why this was such a common practice, but most theories tend to revolve around the idea of releasing some kind of dark supernatural force from the patient. Man, I'm getting real sick of all these evil entities infecting our minds and bodies. Huh. you can say that again. I tell you, I need these demons like I need a hole in the head. No way. Fast forward to 600 BC. Over in India, there lived a guy called Maharshi Susruta. Now, this guy was a medical mastermind. He wrote a treatise known as Susruta Samhita, which described countless different conditions, treatments, and yes, even surgeries. One of which is the first recorded instance of rhinoplasty. That means nose job. A hornbill's a type of bird. I'm here too. Anyway, here's how it's done according to Susruta. First, you get them plastered, obviously. Second, you use a leaf to measure out the part of the nose you want fixed. Then, you use the leaf to cut off a flap of skin from the cheek or forehead of the patient. This part's important though, you gotta remember to leave a little piece of it still attached. Otherwise, you just got a chunk of dirty dead face meat on your hands. Now, wherever you're looking to stick the new flesh on, you rub that part raw with a knife. Also, you're gonna want to stick two plant stalks in their nostrils so their nose keeps its proper shape. Slap the skin on, suture it, dust it with licorice powder for some reason, and cover it with cotton. Sesame oil should be regularly applied until the skin is fully healed. If you're like me, I already do that by default, so it shouldn't be an issue. Finally, at long last, your sniffer is reborn. Don't worry, you still look like a freak just slightly less so. Moving on, our next surgery took place in 10th century Spain on Sancho I of Leon, otherwise known as Sancho the Fat. Now, normally back in the day, having some meat on your bones was a sign of wealth and power and all that, but this guy was like TLC documentary tier, to the point where he could hardly function as a human being. So his constituents said, greetings your thickness. Uh, yeah, you can't be king anymore on account of you keep breaking every horse we give you and nobody wants to wash between your accordion like neck folds no more. After his adipose got him deposed, Sancho decided to seek medical help for his condition under the oversight of well-reputed physician Hazdai Ibn Shapurut, which is an anagram for ha, paintbrush aids. Now, if there's one thing that medieval man understood, it's practicality. Lap band, gastric bypass, belly balloon, these all exist to help people who don't have the self-control to stop eating so much on their own. But Dr. Shapiru didn't believe in beating around the bush. He said, well, why don't we just stop the patient from shoving food into his own greasy maw in the first place, and decided to just up and stitch the dude's lips together. After the operation, the only nutrients that Sancho received came through a straw, in the form of a mixture known as thoriaca, which was a complex blend of several herbs, fruits, and seeds, including opium. It was basically the closest thing you could find to lean at the time, and lean he became, losing around half his weight before ascending to the throne once more. So this is the part of the video where I pander to the desires of the audience. If there's one thing I know you internet people can't get enough of, it's things going inside people's eyeballs. Let's talk about cataract surgery. The art of dealing with people's clouded lenses has been around for millennia, believe it or not. That Susruta guy from earlier actually talked about the most common procedure for cataracts for most of civilized history, which is known as the couching method. Couching is done by taking a sharp object like a needle or a thorn and ever so gently stabbing their eye hole at weird angles until the lens moves out of the way. No lasers, no sedatives, no paralytics, just a rusty old pin and some elbow grease the way God intended. 
The majority of the time, this operation didn't work, usually just damaging the already blind eye irreparably. Shocker, right? And even if it did go as planned, you still, you know, didn't have a lens in your eye, so you essentially went from, I can't tell if I'm dead or not, to, ah, yes, it is quite yellow out today. By God. Something moved somewhere. A slightly more refined version of this operation is the suction method, which dates back to at least the 10th century AD, if not older. This procedure is described as requiring, quote, a large incision in the eye, a hollow needle, and an assistant with an extraordinary lung capacity. Though this reads like the setup to the world's most horrifying party trick, it's actually the bare minimum number of tools needed to completely extract the lens from the eye. In case you didn't pick up on how, here's a diagram. This method generally saw a greater success rate and fewer complications than its non-extracting counterpart. So hopefully you can sleep well tonight knowing that the number of human beings who have sucked a piece of somebody's living eyeball through a straw is above zero. Anywho, let's all just be thankful that we live in an era where procedures like these are a thing of the past. Now remember kids, even though the surgeries I described here do sound pretty easy to pull off, please don't try them at home. But if you do, please put it on live leak afterwards. But you know what you can do at home? Learn stuff about things with Brilliant.org. Brilliant's elegant UI and step-by-step -step design makes learning seemingly complex topics very intuitive, especially for visual learners like me. Don't think you can understand special relativity? With Brilliant, I bet you you can. I'm just some kid in a room somewhere and even I got the basics. Check this out. Relativistic laser tag. Don't tell me that doesn't sound fun. Then later when you're talking to your friends, you can be like, Yeah, I'm taking a course in special relativity right now. No big deal. Maybe gonna hit quantum objects in a couple weeks. So to support me and broaden your understanding of math and science, go to brilliant.org slash salmonella and sign up for free. Also, the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Anyway, till next time, I'm Salmonella, and watch you for thanking. Wait, shit, I meant... This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Hey kids, hope you had yourself a merry little whatever. I know I did. What do you like best about the holiday experience? My personal favorite part is where we systemically brainwash children into thinking they're supernatural beings who judge their every move and then invade their house at night. Now, everyone knows Santa, good old Saint Nick, Ol' Father Christmas, ol' Christopher Kringle, ol' Elpheus Prime, Slayer of Elk and Bringer of Xboxes. And you've probably heard of some other characters somewhere too. Guys like Krampus, Belsnickel, Charlie Brown, Xi Jinping. Well today, I want to show you guys some more obscure Yuletide beings from different cultures all across the globe, but mostly Europe. Now, this first creature's name comes from the Welsh. As a matter of moral principle, I personally don't formally recognize the Welsh language. Maybe someday they'll figure out how W's and Y's work, then it'll be a different story, but for the time being, you'll have to excuse me for not condoning bullshit like this. So the thing allegedly called Marilu weed isn't a true mythical creature per se, but more so a tradition carried out for at least the past few centuries in South Wales. No, I mean Old South Wales. This is how it works. Every holiday season, the village rapscallion will take a horse's skull and affix it to the end of a pole. Kind of like one of these things, except, you know, awful. The skull is typically decorated in some way, and sometimes they put in a lever so you can make the mouth move on its own. Then a white sheet is draped over the pole and its holder, thus giving the illusion that Famine himself has come to destroy destroy all your figgy pudding. From here, one would think that the nightly festivities would include welshing your trousers and repenting for a lifetime of naughtiness, but no, it gets better. You know that whole mouth moving thing? Turns out, that's not just for taking wild snaps at the faces of innocent children. The Madi Luid and its party of caretakers will go around to random houses and sing a song about wanting to be let inside. The inhabitants are then expected to sing back with excuses as to why they don't want this abomination in their home. All in rhyme, of course. This goes back and forth until either the Marie Louise gives up or the party's invited in, at which point they get to raid your pantry and drink all your beer. So if you ever find yourself rap battling a horse skull in South Wales, don't panic. It's normal, I guess. Next we have Frau Perchta, a witch-like being said to visit during the holidays in the Alpine regions of Germany and Austria. Depictions of Perchta can range anywhere between beautiful woman and whatever the hell this is, but usually they fall somewhere in between. She's also sometimes shown with this big weird floppy goose foot, 
That's because she's apparently real into spinning. Not the two foot kind though, the one foot kind. It's said that this delightful spinster pays a visit to all the little wiener schnitzels on the twelfth night of Christmas. If you were well behaved and hard working this year, she might leave you a small silver coin in your shoe. How kind. But if you've been an inattentive young lady and didn't spin all your flax that year, Perchta will trample all your half-woven fibers as punishment, and you'll say, weird flax, but okay. Fucking cut that out, Jesus. Then there's the stuff Perchta considers especially naughty, which can vary depending on who you ask. If you left your house a mess, or you didn't leave out the traditional bowl of porridge, or maybe you didn't eat your ceremonial fish and gruel on feast day, that's when you've been a real goober. As recompense, she'll rip out your fucking intestines through your abdominal wall and then stuff your empty body cavity with pebbles and straw until you're just as plump as when she started. So, you know, you win some, you lose some. Nobody knows what she does with your freshly harvested innards after she leaves. But being that she lives in the mountains and has an obsession with thread making, I think we can all infer the obvious truth. Of course, no discussion of folklore of any kind can truly be complete without taking a look at Iceland. Between the centuries of isolation and the volcanic fumes constantly spilling out over the countryside, it's no wonder that they're one of the world's biggest exporters of whack-ass mythology. Seriously, according to one 1998 survey, over 54% of Icelandic citizens said they believed in elves. Let me repeat that, just so we're all clear. In 1998, the majority of the population of Iceland said they believed in elves, and a very large portion probably still does today. As such, the cast of characters said to visit during the holiday season over there is naturally quite diverse. The main lineup consists of the family pictured here. This is the leader of the bunch, a troll, goblin, ogreish type lady named Grilla. Grilla just fucking eats kids. That's it. She's said to prefer the naughty ones, but as long as it's small and made out of kid, she's game. Then you got her husband, Le Palu, who lives with her in her cave, generally considered to be equally ogreish. When the holidays roll around, if there's no soot in your fireplace, he'll reward you with a pickled herring. But if it's dirty, he'll scoop up the ash and dump it in your bed, ooh. Nah, just messing with you. None of that's true. He also just eats children. The couple also has a giant cat called, uh, this. The cat's main concern is whether or not a person received new clothes for Christmas. Pretty hypocritical considering it walks around naked all the time, but whatever. Anyway, if you got new clothes, then good for you, you got new clothes. On the other hand, if you didn't get any, well, uh, can, can, uh, can, can you guess what he does? Hmm? You want to take a, take a wild stab? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly right. He fucking eats you. Children, adults, doesn't matter. He'll even vore your dog, he doesn't care. Finally, you got the best of the bunch, the 13 Yule Lads, each of which visits on a different day leading up to Christmas. They're kind of like the Seven Dwarves, but whereas those guys are jolly and helpful and stupid shit like that, the only real goal of the Yule Lads is to harass and inconvenience people as much as possible, and each one has a unique way that they go about doing that. I'm gonna go through all 13. Now please remember, I am making none of this up. I'm not even gonna try to say the Icelandic name, so I'll just give you guys the English translations, which are very apt, by the way. First, you got Sheep Coat Claude, who goes around harassing sheep, but he's easy to catch on account of his peg legs. Then there's Gully Gulk, who hides in gullies to steal milk from your cows. There's Stubby, he's real short, he eats the leftover crust out of pie pans. This one's called Spoon Licker, he licks spoons. He's also incredibly thin on account of malnutrition for some reason. There's Pot Scraper, he scrapes pots. And Bowl Licker, who's like Spoon Licker, the key difference here being that uh, he licks bowls. You got Door Slammer, who slams doors in the middle of the night. And then Skier Gobbler, who gobbles up all your skier, which is like a Nordic yogurt type thing. Whoa, who's that up in the rafters? It's Sausage Swiper, of course. Here to swipe your sausages. And who's that in the windows? You bet your ass it's Window Peeper. Look at him peep. And who could forget our favorite, Doorway Sniffer, who sniffs your doorway with his giant freakish nose to seek out bread. There's Meat Hook, he steals your meat with a hook. And finally, Candle Stealer, who fucking, you get the picture. So, if you know some kids who just won't behave, maybe it's time to take a page out of Iceland's book come next holiday season. Now remember, your friend dressed up as Grilla doesn't have to actually eat the kids. Just bite them a couple times, that'll be enough. Anyway, with New Year's right around the corner, the time comes to make our New Year's resolutions. While you may spend New Year's Eve getting hella turnt, why not spend New Year's Day getting hella learnt? You can do just that with Skillshare.org. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 25,000 classes in design, business technology, and more. Premium membership gives you unlimited access to high-quality classes on must-know topics, 
so you can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities, and do the work you love. Beyond technical skills, there's plenty of lifestyle type stuff on here that'd be perfect for building 2019 you. Check this one out. Beat procrastination once and for all. Maybe if I had taken this course, this video would have been out, you know, before Christmas. Do you speak any other languages? Well, you could. Believe me, I get a lot of joy of shoving my Francais down other people's throats. If you try one of these guys on for size, you could be doing the same in no time. Join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer just for my viewers. The first 500 people who visit the link in the description will get two Two months of unlimited access to the 25,000 plus classes on Skillshare for absolutely free. What are you waiting for? Go! Don't just stare at me with your glassy eyes. People are taking them already. Go! Hurry! Run! Anyway, that's all for today. Till next time, I'm Sam Manella, and thank you for watching. Nah, but seriously, fuck Swift the cockatiel. Look at this ugly tree sniffing idiot. I hope he gets AIDS. I mean it. Hey kids, if you've ever been Black Friday shopping or visited the Diablo subreddit recently, chances are you've encountered mass hysteria at some point. Mass hysteria is known medically as Mass Psychogenic Illness, or MPI for short. It's basically just when a bunch of people start acting a fool for no discernible reason other than maybe a stressful environment. Being that this sort of thing is naturally very noticeable, there's loads of documented cases found all throughout history. Let's take a look at a few. This first one is what made me make this video in the first place. So one day sometime in the Middle Ages, a group of nuns in a French convent were enjoying a quiet, uneventful day, until one of them decided to start meowing. You know, like a cat. You'd think this would last all of four seconds before another nun was like, Excuse me, Sister Gertrude, would you kindly cut the shit? But instead, another nun joined in. And another. Until basically the entire nunnery was exchanging mouths like a group of communist trading card enthusiasts. This wasn't just a one-time thing either, it basically became integrated into their way of life. It's said that on a given day, they would stand there meowing in each other's faces for hours at a time. Could you imagine being the first outsider to witness this? You might laugh now, but as they say, Everybody gangsta till the nuns start meowing. I'd void my bowels and move to Malaysia without even thinking. Miles more terrifying than this pile of garbage. As you can imagine though, after a while it stopped being scary and just got annoying, leading to the neighbors calling in a band of soldiers to deal with the situation. Hey guys, can we talk to you for a sec about uh... Yeah. Yeah, that. Uh, all due respect, but we have orders to literally beat the hell out of you with whips till you start acting like people again. Sorry sir, it's just... Force of habit. Haha, <laughs> habit. Seriously though, we would rather go to hell for throttling a gaggle of nuns than put up with another minute of your bullshit, Caprese. Our next event took place in the parish of Fatima, Portugal in the year 1917. It all started with three shepherd children, ages 10, 9, and 7 respectively. They were like, greetings fellow Portugueseites. Uh, we've been seeing visions of the Virgin Mary, and she told us to tell you that some real crazy shit's gonna go down in the sky on October 13th. Now, if three random farm children started spouting out prophecies to the public today, you'd say, ha, huh, what tomfoolery. Go play in some dirt, you dirty little dirt baby. But keep in mind, the past is a different country. And Portugal's a different country. So that's like, different country squared you gotta think about. Plus this was during World War I, a time where a lot of people were holding out for a miracle to begin with. So the kid's story was actually picked up and even spread by local newspapers, to the point where, when the day finally came, at least 30,000 people gathered in Fatima to witness the alleged miracle. Lo and behold, on that day, the sun began zooming around, careening towards Earth and sending rays of multicolored light cascading across the sky, creating a light show like nobody's ever seen. Keep in mind, this happened in the 20th century, way after the era where belief in divine jiggery and or pokery was considered mandatory, so naturally there were plenty of skeptics and non-believers present, and even they saw it all happen. Or so they thought. How do we know the sun didn't really whiz around haphazardly that day, hmm? Well, number one, use your frickin' brain. And number two, accounts differed wildly from person to person. While some say the sun zigged hither, others say it zagged thither. And others still said it shined a brilliant yellow and stayed perfectly still. As such, it was eventually concluded that the event was just a combination of MPI and weird eye stuff from too much sun staring. Although I'd like to believe it was real, just that Jesus' illusion skill was way higher than his alteration at the time. Yep, that's it. Sam's going to hell. Why, for blasphemy?
Trust me, that was the least offensive part of that joke. Our next tale took place in 1962 in Tanganyika, which was basically just the beta version of Tanzania. The nation had just declared its independence from Britain the previous year, and with the future so uncertain, tensions were naturally running high around this time. One little girl in a Tanganyikan school ended up handling the stress in a bit of an unusual way. Rather than overeating or staring at her ceiling for hours like a normal person, she just started laughing, and laughing, and laughing. Pretty soon, her classmates at the all-girls school she attended began to join in, to the point where 95 of the 159 students caught the gigglies, which lasted anywhere from a few hours to 16 days straight. Beyond just the unprovoked cackling, other odd behavior included aimless running and occasional violence. The problem got so severe that the school was forced to close down temporarily, leading to the chortlers roaming the streets, spreading the affliction further. Thousands of people from all strata came to be affected, with 13 additional schools being shut down in the progress. Over the course of the hysteria, several other symptoms began to present themselves as well, ranging from obvious ones such as breathing problems, fainting, random screaming, to more anomalous things like rashes. Despite all this, no physical cause could be found, leaving MPI as the only explanation. The epidemic finally died down after between 6 and 18 months of day in, day out laughter, depending on the village. While this whole thing likely sucked for most people involved, it probably could have been worse. A lot of the time when I'm alone, I'll think to myself, man, if I ever go full schizo, I hope I'm one of the laughy ones, not one of the screamy ones. With this story in mind, just maybe, if I put my mind to it and believe hard enough, I can be both. Flashback to the year 1518 did the city of Strasbourg, at the time part of the HRE. A woman named Mrs. Trophy began fervently dancing in the streets for no discernible reason, for hours, then days. All without music, of course. Her only breaks consisted of occasional food intake and passing out from exhaustion when night came. If you saw that today, you'd just be like, ha! Huh drugs. But apparently people found it pretty inspiring, because within a week, 34 others had joined in, and after a month, there were around 400. This wasn't your casual bobbing up and down, neither. This shit made Zumba look like Tai Chi. Here's the best modern day simulation I could find. <laughs> Now imagine that both of those people were the same person, and you got the dancing plague. This would take a toll on any healthy person, let alone a medieval city dweller. But despite bleeding feet and aching bones, they just kept going. In fact, they went so hard for so long that a good portion straight up fucking died from cardiac arrest. It got to the point where around 15 dancers were kicking the bucket every day before the city decided they had to do something about it. They managed to rule out any divine or supernatural causes, which was necessary just because, you know, back in medieval times, it was fucking stupid. They eventually surmised that it was a natural disease caused by too much hot blood as per that whole four humors thing that was popular at the time. As for a cure, their prescription was, get this, more dancing. I can see where they were coming from, it's pretty sound logic, if you got a song stuck in your head, you play it till you're sick of it, same kind of thing. But here's where they goofed. The authorities actually went out of their way to facilitate the dancing, setting up a big stage area and even hiring musicians to keep the afflicted moving. All this achieved was attracting more passerby who were like, man, mass psychogenic illness looks frickin' epic, let's get in on that, causing the contagion to become even more widespread. Seeing that their solution backfired, the city then went the other way and completely banned any public dancing. Those who still showed signs of the mania were subsequently carted off to the Shrine of St. Vitus, where an exorcism-like ritual was performed on them. This ended up being highly effective, presumably for no other reason than that the dancers believed it would work, and after nearly two months, the plague was quelled. While this whole thing was most likely a case of good old-fashioned MPI, some historians believe it might have been egged on in part by ergotism, a state of psychosis brought on by eating tainted bread, which I talked a little bit about in this video. Ding. And hey, while I'm shilling for my channel, I might as well give a shout out to another as well. Today's video is sponsored by Cheddar, a network focused on producing fascinating content covering topics like technology, products, businesses, and the like through the lens of innovation. Here's one about desire paths, you know, like those lines of dead grass from people taking more convenient routes through places. It's one of those things that plenty of us have thought about but never actually explored in depth like this video. Cheddar's full of intriguing stuff like that, I highly recommend giving them a look. If you're more science oriented, they still got you covered with their Cheddar Explorer series. This one's all about how it can be sure if a species is really extinct or not. They talk a bit about animals we thought were gone that suddenly reappeared out of nowhere. Super interesting, go check it out. Anyway, that's all for today. Till next time, I'm Sam Manella and thank you for watching.
Hey kids, you've probably seen this scene in TV or movies at some point. A couple of people end up stranded on a desert island, totally isolated from all civilization. It seems like there's no hope for survival, but then one of them looks three feet to the left and, oh my god, it's a tree full of fully grown, plump, delicious, smiling, golden skinned bananas. Amazing. We're saved for the time being. Hey, don't eat those. They're made of lies. See? Listen, why do fruit exist? For a delicious, nutritious snack for humans and animals alike to enjoy? You know, you didn't have to go throwing him into the sun like that. You're next, Susan! H how did you know my name? I created you. Anyway, as most of you probably know, fruit are a thing because nature figured out, hey, if you put a little bit of deliciousness around your seed, it'll convince some idiot bird or something to carry your baby off to faraway lands, right? But then humans showed up and were like, hey, that's pretty nifty. Listen, is it cool if we selectively breed you for thousands of years to give you horrific deformities to crank up that whole deliciousness part a couple hundred notches? Alright, cool. Let's take a look at bananas, specifically the Cavendish variety that we all know and love. On the inside, we got like 2% seeds, 93% delectable banana meat, and 5% that brown part at the bottom that your mom says is perfectly fine to eat but you still don't trust. Great for a snack, terrible for reproducing efficiently. Meanwhile, check out the thing on the right here. That's Musa acuminata, one of the suspected ancestors of today's nanners. Much smaller and jam-packed with seeds, with just enough flesh in there to make it worth some smelly primate's time to crack open a yellow one with the boys. Here's another wild-type banana, Musa balbiziana. Less sweet, way starchier, harder to get into, hella seeds, same shit different day really. But hey, if you stick that boy in the ground, you've got an okay chance of making a new banana tree. You bury a modern banana, all you're gonna to end up with is a dirty banana. And not that one club in Miami, I mean an actual dirty banana. That's because, like a lot of cultivated fruit, culinary bananas are so inbred and malformed that they can't produce offspring even if they wanted to. So word of advice for you men out there, if ever a lady points out how poorly endowed you are, just show her this JPEG. She'll say, wow, I didn't realize it was so potent and fertile. You really opened my eyes, thank you. Bananas aren't the only piece of produce to follow this pattern though, not by a long shot. For example, take the watermelon. According to Monsanto, everybody's favorite corporation, the first evidence of human cultivation of the watermelon dates back to Egypt around 5,000 years ago. Back then, they were only two inches in diameter, around the size of a tennis ball. The flesh was supposedly tough and bitter, much like that of a tennis ball. Of course, just as the growth of a delicious green baby takes time, so so too did the evolution of the modern watermelon. In fact, even as late as the mid-1600s, watermelons looked way different from what we have today, as shown by this painting by Giovanni Stanchi. Notice the thicker rind, the larger seeds, and the weird segmentation on the inside. Definitely a cooler still life subject, but ultimately inferior as a summertime snack. How about vegetables? Tell me, do you enjoy cabbage, brussels sprouts, kale, collard greens, broccoli, or cauliflower? I mean, I guess I like broccoli and cauliflower, the rest are kind of gross though. WRONG! All six of these vegetables are actually the same thing! That means you like them all! That's not how that works. I'll be good. Anyway, these veggies are all just cultivars of the same species, Brassica oleracea, otherwise known as wild cabbage. Every part of the plant is edible to some extent, but there's not much of it to go around. So a bunch of different people throughout history said, alright, what if we just take one specific part of the plant and go fucking insane with it? And that's what they did. Those who bred for giant leaves got kale. Going for huge dense flower buds gets you broccoli. Juicy engorged lateral leaf buds equal brussels sprouts, etc. Speaking of segues, let's check out egg plants. The OG eggplant was first domesticated in India where it can still be found in the wild today. It looks nothing like an eggplant though, they actually resemble little green berries the size of grapes. The only thing it seems to have in common with the classic purple eggplant is how little both of them have in common with an egg. However, if we add the RGB percentage values of their color and merge their shapes, we do get what looks approximately like an egg. So I guess that solves that mystery. This whole transformation really is a testament to man's greatness though. That's like starting out with a frog and selectively breeding them until you end up with Grimace from McDonald's lore. Speaking of which, did you know Grimace used to be evil and have four arms? This is a real thing. I'd like to think that when they lopped off his extra limbs, all his evil energy went with him. And now there's just two plump purple cylinders scampering around the countryside waiting to pull unsuspecting kids under ball pits never to be seen again. That's just my McDonald's headcanon though. Anyway, back to whatever we were talking about. Next is corn, or sorry, maize. I call it corn like a normal person. If it was supposed to be called maize, these would be called maize mazes. Obviously, that's like the perfect opportunity, but they're not, so put an etymological sock in it. 
or stocking. Anyway, I was totally expecting old corn to look like those baby corns you find in Chinese food and literally nowhere else. Turns out those actually are just baby corns. One suspected ancestor of corn is known as Teo Sinti, which looks like this. Gee whiz, Sam, that sure does look like garbage. Good eye, Billy. That's because it was garbage. Whereas modern corn has a kernel count in the hundreds, Teo Sinti only has 5 to 12, with each one being encased in a hard shell that's basically impossible to get into short of boiling it or chipping a tooth. The fact that people decided to domesticate it in the first place makes sense once you realize that most grains are basically the same thing. But honestly, that just makes me wish people figured out how to turn a piece of wheat into a big chunk of whatever to gnaw on. This whole thing disappointed me so much that I actually moved it to the top of my list of reasons not to visit the Mayans if I ever get a time machine. Nonetheless, as you can see, human endeavor can accomplish amazing things. And just as a few thousand years of selective breeding can turn this into this, a few hours of learning a week can turn you into, you know, a more talented and interesting version of you. And what better way to do that than with Skillshare.com? Skillshare is an online learning community with over 22,000 classes in technology, design, business, and more. Premium membership gives you unlimited access to high-quality classes on must-know topics so you can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities, and do the work you love. They've got great courses in just about any creative pursuit you can think of. I used to be totally musically illiterate till I took this course, then I made this. What about food? You like food? Of course you do. You'd be dead if you didn't. With Skillshare, you can make your own macaroons, fresh pasta, spring rolls, whatever. Join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer just for my viewers, where you can get two months of Skillshare for free. To sign up, go to skl.sh slash samo2. Again, for those in the back, go to skl.sh slash samo2 to get two months of unlimited access to over 22,000 classes for free. Act now for this special offer and start learning today. Anyway, till next time, I'm Sam Manella, and thank you for watching. Premium Mender- uh, Premium Mender- uh, Mendership! What the f- Alright, after months upon months of unrelenting pressure by you psychopaths pretending to be my characters on Twitter, I finally got a merch store. Let this be a lesson, kids. With enough harassment, you can achieve anything. Anyway, go check it out, or don't, whatever. Hey kids, if I learned anything from my middle school career, it's that what may seem like a good idea initially will often be remembered only as a foolish mistake. Here's a few pieces of technology from yesteryear that have since fallen into total obscurity. So I've always believed that there's no point in having many small things when you can have one big thing. Why have many shrimp when you can have one lobster? Why drink many glasses of milk when you can eat one udder? Why have many cheese its when you can have one cheese them? Patent pending. And why have many street lights when you can have one moonlight Tower. These guys were real popular back in the 1880s and 90s, often standing at over 150 feet tall and illuminating several blocks from a single point. Not very well, mind you. Matter of fact, they were so dim, we didn't even have the conscience to just call them light towers. Had to go and stick the moon on the front so people didn't get their hopes up. But thanks to our good old friend, the inverse square law, you still needed a fuck ton of light to pull this off. So they used incredibly harsh and UV emitting arc lights instead of incandescent bulbs. All the light of the moon and all the vision damage of the sun? Talk about a win-win. Sadly, these beasts have fallen by the wayside over the past century or so. Except for in Austin, apparently. But they use friendlier mercury vapor lamps in them, so they only get half points. Now, anyone who's been around a baby long enough knows they always have a cloud of ghoulish stench hovering around them. Jeez Louise, somebody better air out that musty little muskrat before Grandma starts drooping again. You could stick him on the clothesline for a while, but knowing that little moron, I'm sure he'd find a way to hurt himself somehow. Introducing the baby cage. Finally, city dwellers all across the nation have a way of unleashing their postnatal funk on the unsuspecting passerby below. These were in vogue for a while before falling out of style a bit of the way into the 20th century, because apparently society started deeming babies more valuable than air conditioners. I don't really get it personally, but this is also around the time we started putting lead in gasoline, so it's probably for the best we kept them inside all day. Matter of fact, it's my firm belief that without kids growing up breathing lead, there's no way pet rocks would have taken off in the 70s. Wow, alienating 
being baby boomers. He's so brave and controversial. Now, in the days between the Great War and the not as great but still pretty alright war, people were trying to find efficient means of detecting an incoming air attack. They climbed their nation's tallest mountains to seek the wisdom of their greatest elders, and the wise man said, hmm, big ears. So that's what they did. These giant discs were known as acoustic mirrors, and were designed to focus incoming sound over a 5 meter diameter into a single point. They were reasonably effective as listening devices. A few of them in Britain were able to pick up the sound of a plane from all the way across the English Channel. Of course, radar came along soon after, rendering these things completely useless beyond looking brutalist as hell. For real, instant album cover material right here. Ah! One of the pet boys is pulling a Spanish Inquisition on this poor wayward harlot! Huh. Just kidding. Despite the fact that this looks so very, very much like a state-of-the-art instrument of torture, it's actually just a beauty micrometer. Think those shoe size measure things at Foot Locker, only instead of one primitive measurement, it records the entire topology of your face and skull at once. With this data, a trained cosmetologist would be able to pinpoint exactly what features of your head should be enhanced and reduced with makeup in order to achieve a maximum calculated attractiveness after you've paid for their services. Clearly this device must have been effective. After all, beauty is entirely objective. What, Eye of the Beholder? Huh. <laughs> Check the name tag, buddy. Apparently, though, women didn't like being strapped into a birdcage and having their every minute flaw meticulously laid out in front of them, so this thing never really took off in the end. Next, we have the Humlauf. This was a device made during World War II designed to let infantry shoot around corners. It's like the Germans sat down and watched that part in Tom and Jerry where the conniving rat bends the gun barrel back at his adversary. They said, Mein Gott. They came in a variety of angles between 30 and 90 degrees, and even came with a little periscope so you could see what you were shooting at. But as we all come to find out when we reach adolescence, cartoons are the arbiters of deceit, because these things would invariably break within the first couple hundred shots or so. And even when they did work, the rounds would fucking explode from the massive acceleration, turning a deadly bullet into an ineffectual spray of shrapnel. These were so ineffective that only the 30 degree model ever saw significant production beyond prototypes, and even that was very limited. Say, you ever look at regular mouse traps and go, hmm, not enough property damage? Well check this out. Patented in 1882, it's the revolver mouse trap, brought to you by the makers of the snail trebuchet and the cockroach claymore. Thanks to the marvels of the modern era, all those tiresome hours of intense varmint slang can be outsourced to one little gadget on the floor of your kid's playroom. Now when you hear a gunshot in the middle of the night, you can rest easy knowing that, one way or the other, there's one less pest for you to deal with in the morning. Boom. 1850. Steam locomotives are all the rage. You're in the transport business, but all you can afford is a couple dumb horses. Sure, they move things from point A to point B almost as well at a fraction of the cost, but your cool rail-riding friends called you a whack-ass and it really hurt your feelers. Well, have we got the invention for you? The Impulsoria uses an ingenious system of treadmills to turn that horse to be beckoned into a force to be reckoned with. Sure, it's expensive as hell to make and limits your services entirely to railroads, but just look at it. Instant pussymobile. Slap some rims and a spoiler on that, you're laughing. This machine is recorded at having a maximum output of 2-4 to four horsepower, which sounds about right, and it didn't see much use outside a couple exhibitions. Now, if there's one hobby that people in the past enjoyed, it's smoking. Who boy did they like smoking. And with every great wholesome activity comes a million novelty items to go along with it. Everyone's seen the long cigarette, but how about the really long cigarette? Wanna smoke in the rain? Here you go. Going snorkeling? Hey, you know what's more important than oxygen? Nicotine. But hey, wanna know the only thing better than a cigarette? Two cigarettes. You know what, fuck it. Have the whole pack. You earned it. Of course, if you're trying to cut back, you can always share it with a friend. Aw, how heartburning. But you know it's even more fun than addiction? High quality documentaries. That's why you should check out Curiosity Stream. From the face behind the Discovery Channel, Curiosity Stream lets you stuff your little meatuses full of all the bizarre knowledge the world has to offer. And with over 2400 titles, there's no way there isn't something that interests you here. Remember Secret Life of Pets? Trash movie. Turgid prose, stilted dialogue, pandering humor, and above all, highly unrealistic. On the other hand, The Secret Life of Dogs is an absolute treasure. Did you know they turn their tongues into weird inside out ladles when they drink? Just one of the many fun facts found inside. Normally, full access to Curiosity Stream only costs $2.99 a month or $20 a year, which is nothing. That's like a McDonald's run every four months. But if you still have your doubts, you can get 30 days free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash salmonella and use promo code salmonella during the sign up process. Anyway, that's all for today. Till next time, I'm Sam Manella, and check out this JPEG.
Hey kids, I think we can all agree that there are few pastimes more grotesque than competitive eating. The concept of a bunch of guys pushing their anatomy to its limits just for sport leaves a bad taste in my mouth in more ways than one. But imagine if these men didn't adopt this habit just for fun. Imagine if some gross biological error forced them to eat like this for their entire life. Introducing Tarare. Tarare was born in France around 1772 to a poor farming family. It's said that his appetite was so voracious that, by his teens, Tarare could eat an entire quarter of a cow carcass in a single day. You'd think he'd be like mega obese, but no, he only weighed 100 pounds by age 17. However, there were still a few things that stood out about Tarare appearance-wise. For one, he had a huge, stretched-out mouth with horribly stained teeth. He could reportedly fit 12 eggs in his cheeks at once, much like a chipmunk keeping its chipmunk eggs warm. Additionally, when Terrari was full, he'd get a crazy Octomom gut going, and any other time, he'd have a huge flap of stretched out skin hanging around his waist. He also stank to high hell, even by 18th century French peasant standards. He was described as reeking, quote, to such a degree that he could not be endured within the distance of 20 paces. So between all this and his horrendous outhouse flooding dumps, his family had had enough. Alright, you're eating us out of house and home here. You gotta go, man. You heard me kick bricks, froggy. Wow, he just called a French person a frog. That's so racist. No, it's not. They're all French. The guy just looks like a frog is all. Wow. Oh. Well, too late. I'm already offended. That's fair. Dislike. After leaving home, Tarare was forced to beg and steal just to satisfy his gargantuan appetite. Inevitably, people began to take notice of him, and eventually he landed a job as a street performer in Paris. People would hand Tarare entire baskets of apples, eggs, and even wine corks, and watch in delight as he horked them down without the slightest hesitation. Normally, this went off without a hitch, except for one time when he suffered a severe intestinal blockage. Fortunately, the crowd was kind enough to carry him to the hospital, where he was treated with the strongest laxatives the 18th century had to offer. I would draw what happened next, but it would probably get my channel deleted. So let's just picture it for a few moments. <sighs> Moving on. Cut to the year 1792. This marks the beginning of the War of the First Coalition. Ever heard of it? Me neither. Who was in it? Fucking everyone. Anyway, Terare decided to enlist in the war. After all, maybe that profound emptiness he was feeling was just a lack of purpose in life. Turns out, no, he really was just psychotically hungry. Even after being granted quadruple rations, Terrari would still be digging through the trash pile whenever he got the chance. After suffering extreme exhaustion, he was sent off to the military hospital in Soutorin. The staff there were so dumbfounded by the man's abilities that they decided to keep him there to run a few experiments. The first of which involved putting Terrari in a room with a meal prepared for 15 people. Naturally, he ate the entire thing and immediately fell asleep. Next, they presented him with a raw eel. In response, Terrari crushed the eel's skull between his teeth before slurping down the entire creature in one go. Now, this is hair-clenchingly horrifying for a couple of reasons. Firstly, he put a whole frickin' eel in his stomach, but secondly, there had to be some point during digestion where the meat was gone but the bones still remained. Now, for those of you who don't know, an eel skeleton looks like this. That means Terrari had all of those needle-sized ribs stabbing into the walls of his stomach at once, and he was fine. He also ripped a live cat apart with his bare hands, drank its blood, and ate everything but its bones, and then later gagged up the fur and skin like an owl, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. After reviewing our data, I've come to the scientific conclusion that, uh, yeah, we got a goddamn demon on our hands. But as we all know, with great devour comes great responsibility. Since Tarare was still technically enlisted, the military decided to utilize his abilities for the greater good. Hey Tarare, it's me, the General. Listen, could you eat this box with a note in it for me? Hmm. If you do it, we'll give you a wheelbarrow full of bull organs. <laughs> Lo and behold, two days later, he passed the container in mint condition and was given his reward as promised. With this proof of concept, they made him an official spy and sent him into Prussia with a document in his belly to be delivered to an imprisoned French colonel. Unfortunately, there are a couple things Torare couldn't do that are generally important when sneaking into another country. A, he couldn't speak German, and B, it's pretty hard to maintain a low profile when you're running around like a madman wolfing down garbage and mutilating small animals. So he ended up being captured by the enemy. Initially, he kept his mouth shut, for once, but after a whipping and a day in jail, Terare gave in. After confessing that he did, in fact, have vital intelligence snaking its way through his GI tract, the Prussians chained him to a latrine until the box emerged 30 hours later. The note wasn't actually anything important, so they just mock executed him, gave him a severe beating, and sent him on his way. After all that, Terare returned to life at the hospital, desperate for a cure for his condition, but nothing they ever tried worked. Meanwhile, the man's endless hunger continued to get him into all sorts of trouble. He'd often sneak out of the hospital 
little to eat the scraps behind the local butcher and fight stray dogs in the alley for their precious garbage. He'd also seek out patients undergoing bloodletting in order to take all their life juice for himself. On several occasions, he was even caught attempting to eat bodies in the mortuary. By this point in my research, I was so desensitized to this guy that I didn't even bat an eye when I first read that. I was just like, alright. Guess he must have been hungry. Anyway, the hospital staff begrudgingly tolerated Tarare's buffoonery, until one day when he went too far. Well, Tarare, you've only had three mess hall raids, four miscellaneous trash-related mishaps, and one cadaver defiling, so I'd say, so far, this week's been pretty good. Uh, doctor, we should probably inform you that a 14-month-old child has gone missing from their room. Tarare, look at me. Did you eat a fucking baby? Terrare was promptly kicked out of the hospital and spent four years out and about doing, you know, whatever horrific shit you can imagine. When he came back, he was suffering from advanced tuberculosis and died shortly after arrival. During his autopsy, the surgeons found that when they looked into his mouth, they could see all the way down his throat and into his stomach cavity. As you can imagine, his whole abdominal region was profoundly deformed. Basically, if this is a normal human, this is what they found inside Terrare. Just like the man's mind, we can see that around 90% is devoted towards food and 10% towards everything else. So, moral of the story here is that, no, you know what, not even I can find anything resembling a moral here. Not all stories have a point to them. Sometimes they're just sad and disgusting from beginning to end. And now a word from our sponsor. As you can probably tell, I'm a very visual person when it comes to learning. I firmly believe that engaging visuals are an essential teaching tool that allows for much deeper comprehension than plain old walls of text. That's why I'm pleased to introduce our sponsor, Brilliant.org. We all know that math and science are really important to master, and Brilliant's elegant UI and step-by-step -step design makes learning seemingly complex topics very intuitive, especially for visual learners. Their straightforward graphics, delightful animations, and interactive puzzles make it easy and fun to hone your own critical thinking skills. Personally, I've always been super intrigued by neural networks and all the things you can do with them, but I've always been too intimidated to research them in depth. After learning about Brilliant, I actually started taking their course in the subject, and I gotta say, it's been such a pleasurable experience that I plan to continue with it in my own spare time. To support me and learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash salmonella and sign up for free. Also, the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Till next time, I'm Sam Manella, and thank you for watching.